Thank you, Mr. Falcone, Dr. Veronese, members of the Board of Ed, faculty and staff, school administration, parents and supporters, my fellow class members of the class of 2015, and anyone who requested a call out in my speech, consider your request granted. So I've been to three graduation ceremonies already as a member of the brass choir, who as always did an excellent job, even though they're not here anymore. So <laughs> three graduation ceremonies. That means that I've played about 30 iterations of Pomp and Circumstance as students from three years have walked down the aisles that are not here because we're at Wesleyan. I've watched about 400 grad graduating seniors walk across the stage to get their diplomas, and I've seen six of these speeches delivered already. Every speech had something different about it. The girl who had this gift before me made her entire speech rhyme. The valedictorian two years ago reminded her class to always stay classy, and my dear sister three years ago in her valedictorian speech decided to listen to her friend's advice and rip up her speech when she got to the podium. She had another copy. <laughs> so every speech had something special, whether it's a vivid anecdote or something particularly striking or a gimmick like ripping or rhyming. So I decided I might as well get that gimmick out of the way first. So let's get this over with. <laughs> Juggling. Such an interesting yet completely unnecessary skill to have. There's no point in putting it on a resume because most non-circus jobs are not looking for that particular set of skills. Sure, it looks pretty cool at first, but I wish I could go back in time and tell my 11-year-old self that no, it will not be a chick magnet. <laughs> but it does, does look pretty impressive for being a simple pattern of throwing up and catching balls. You throw up the first ball, and you have to throw up the second one before you catch the first one, and then so on. It's just something simple and cool that you can do with your hands. There are a lot of simple and cool things that you can do with your hands. We really take for granted all the things the hand does for us. It can throw and catch, it can write, it can wave, it can punch and high five, it can operate things and push buttons, it feels and it explodes for us. We wouldn't have gotten so far as the human species without those dexterous appendages at the end of our hands. Limbs. But yeah, there are a lot of small parts of life that play a giant role in our lives that we don't think about or appreciate much. I've always thought that the two most underappreciated things you can do that make life that much better for us are to laugh and to take a deep breath. Think about what a deep breath does for you. It never makes things worse. It alleviates stress. It slows things down. I believe that people who remember to take deep breaths as a daily regimen live a lot longer. Think about what a deep breath would do for all of us right now. Our parents sitting in the audience for the last half hour or so before the children receive their diplomas. My fellow students sitting there in front of me, waiting for the speeches to finally end so we can get this done with. And finally, our speeches and supporter, our teachers and our supporters who are watching the fruition of four plus, four, four plus years of helping us learn and face our challenges. And me, giving you this speech, trying to convince myself that I am not at all nervous. So let's take advantage of the deep breaths. Let's all do one right now. Do it with me. Now see, isn't life that much better? So now let's look at the laugh. We laugh when things are awkward. We laugh when things are funny or weird. We laugh when we're happy or even when we're sad. Our laughs punctuate our lives with joy and emotion. It's extraordinary that humans have developed the ability to laugh, to add a little bit of richness to our lives, to make things a little bit brighter. I find myself wondering, why exactly do we laugh? What triggers something in the human brain that prompts us to smile and to giggle? What makes things funny, so, sometimes so funny that we can't help from laughing? Why is it that people can make a living going up on stages and podiums like the one I'm at right now, with a bunch of prepared random sentences strung together into jokes, and people find that unbearably entertaining? What is funny? It seems like such a simple concept. It's, it's com almost completely unexplainable. Humor is one of those things that falls into the category of truly human things that are almost impossible to, ex to explain, like poetry or like love. Humor is not a science, yet. As an analytically oriented son of two scientists, I've always thought that everything in life will, will be and can be explainable by science. We live in this age of rapidly accelerating scientific progress, where we figured out answers to things we previously assumed would always be mysteries. Even the human brain, the thing responsible for creating thoughts and storing memories and making interactions and making life interesting and unique, the thing responsible for all that progress, has been dissected and mapped out into a bunch of nerves and electrical activity. We've identified the chemicals that make us happy and sad, what parts of the brain store our memories and ideas, and what ways we can manipulate them. 
We progress past simply building machines that can accomplish basic human tasks and mimic basic human, human activities like running, playing sports, or even juggling. And now we're building robots with their own constructed minds who can communicate with us and listen to us. Perhaps you even have one in your pocket right now. We're creating artificial minds that can pass the Turing test, Alan Turing's famous benchmark for determining when computers really think like humans, when one cannot tell just from conversation whether the thing they are communicating with is a man or a machine. It's pretty frightening to think about. We're approaching where the point where technology might be encroaching upon the very skills that distinguish us as humans instead of machines. Soon we might be seeing robots who can laugh and tell jokes. Maybe one day robots will be writing literature and engaging in philosophical debates, or discussing government policy and waging wars against each other. So then you ask yourself, how far will science go in the, into the realm of human thought before it reaches an, reaches an impasse? Will it ever stop at a set boundary between machine and humanity? I remember of the, an episode of the classic sitcom, The Big Bang Theory, where Sheldon, the most awkward of the show's stereotypical super geek gang, attempts to construct on a whiteboard an algorithm for the very human concept of making friends. Now, this set of instructions isn't that complicated. You can get a shirt up with it if you want to look particularly nerdy. It looks like one of those questionnaires you might find in a magazine that asks you a set of yes or no questions that lead you to more questions and eventually an outcome. So in this episode, Sheldon calls up a guy he's trying to make friends with, and he asks him various questions on the instruction sheet. Would you like to share a meal? Do you enjoy a hot beverage? What are your interests, etc. But the guy keeps saying the wrong things. He says no to the first couple of questions, and then pr pr proposes a bunch of his interests, all of which Sheldon does not find acceptable. He eventually gets stuck in an un unending loop, proving that this algorithm does not properly work. Obviously, human interaction is much more complicated than a step-by-step -step plan written out on a big whiteboard. Up until now, it seemed impossible to use science to accurately predict human conversations and manipulate interactions. And I believe that that unpredictability is what really makes us humans instead of robots. You never perfectly know what people might say to you or what they're thinking about. And that makes it that much more interesting to watch life unfold, since you never know what might happen. One would assume that no algorithm or program can give a robot that same unpredictability. But then perhaps we're on the verge of having mastered Turing's test. In fact, we already have. Last year, they built a robot in Ukraine who passed the test by fooling his interviewers into thinking it was a 13-year-old boy. We're getting better and better at predicting those conversations and being able to have our artificial minds adapt to them. I'm sure many of us have answered phone calls from robots on marketing or service calls and chatted with them and had our questions answered without us ever realizing that they weren't real people. Perhaps then, there one day will be a robot that can make friends with us. If we go by the premise that everything is scientifically explainable, then that algorithm for making friends must be possible. Even if, it, even if it involves countless variables and is far more convoluted than a simple flowchart on a board. It is very possible that every function of the brain, the way it communicates with others, the way it builds relationships, the way it solves problems, all that can be codified and mimicked. Everything we say and do, everything we think or experience, might just be scientifically explainable and manipulatable. It could be that humor is a science. Love might be a science. English might be a science. Heck. Political science might actually be a science. <laughs> to me, that's both humbling and extremely frightening. To explain those unexplainable things is to start filtering out that natural unpredictability of life that makes it so great. Questions about philosophy, about politics and society, about war and about peace, they make up such a key part of who we are and what we do as a civilization. What well, if all those things can be solved and there are no more questions to be answered? It's a really scary thought that all thought is explainable. It makes, it makes us ask whether we should, as humans, try and choose to stop. Whether there must be a definitive line drawn between what a robot can achieve and what has to remain solely for us. So what does all my rambling about robots and humans have to do with school and our graduating to the real world? I refer you again to the realm of television in an episode of the classic cartoon, The Fairly Odd Parents. In this episode, Timmy, the main character, is transported to the future, where robots dominate life in almost all aspects. At one point, Timmy who goes to school with all his friends. They walk into a classroom, which has a robot for a teacher, and they sit down at the desks, and then big helmets descend upon them. Five, five seconds later, there's a ding, and the voice announces that all the information from the day of school has been transmitted into their brains. Then they leave school, and that's it. That's the extent of their school experience. I ask you, as my fellow members of the class of 2015, to think about what life would have been like if those helmets existed. If we hadn't 13, had spent 13 years together in an enclosed space for six hours each day, communicating with and learning from each other.
There's something about the experience of school that isn't just about the academic knowledge that you learn. It's filled with goals to reach and challenges to overcome. You experience failure. You have to work for what you want, whether it be success in academia or otherwise. No helmet could come close to giving us the chance to fail and to grow from it. To learn skills like juggling, you have to fail a whole bunch before you get it right. All those times that I dropped a ball, it was just as much a part of my learning process as the times I finally got it right. If the ability to juggle were simply zapped into my mind, I wouldn't have spent a whole summer dropping balls and then finally finding that immense satisfaction when I got it successfully. This graduation is the culmination of years of experiences that helped craft who we are. In this helmetless school, you went on field trips and played sports. You dabbled in arts and in music. Over 180 days each year, your teachers guide your learning, not just about math or English or history, but also in understandings that no robot could ever model. Skills that are the essence of our humanity, like how to be considerate and observant, or charismatic and outgoing. At least for now, no robot can simulate that for us. We had those very human experiences. We had fun as kids together. We fought together and worked together on teams and won championships. We had pillow fights together. We laughed together. And so, even as we leave school and grow up alongside this rapidly growing age of scientific technology, even as science, scientists build their own working artificial brain, we shouldn't forget the value in not knowing everything. Not knowing why we live the way we live, or think the way we think. We should appreciate the finer things in life, the unexplainable human things that make life richer and more complex and wondrous. We should want, we should want to have to learn for years the proper way to make friends not be handed a set of instructions and be immediately successful at it. We should want to have to drop the juggling balls before we successfully learn to juggle. We shouldn't ask why we laugh, but take advantage of the fact that we can to do it as much as possible. Thank you.